Cutting straight across now to the UK Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab speaking. On the 15th of August, uh, how many contacts did you have uh, with people like Mohreddin or Meridov or indeed Kamilov uh, in the region? Well, just to give you a sense, um, as I've I think already been clear, but throughout August, uh, I've spoken with Foreign Minister Qureshi, for example. Uh, the Prime Minister spoke to Prime Minister Khan. Uh, Lord Ahmed was in Pakistan during June. Opportunities for all of those conversations. Um, and we obviously stay in regular touch with our ambassadors. Uh, it's probably also worth, uh, in terms of Pakistan and Afghanistan, explaining some context. From early 2019, uh, we have been facilitating a private high-level uh, channel uh, between Afghanistan and Pakistan. It was led by the Chief of the Defence Staff, it was bolstered by senior officials in my department. Uh, and one of the reasons we set that up and I wanted to continue it and indeed have it report directly to me is to make sure we had more granular advice on the developments uh, on the ground and a greater ability to influence it. I oversaw that directly. Um, uh, CDS reported to me, FCO, FCO officials did as well, and obviously it's a supplementary means, but quite an important one, given uh, from the normal um, channels. I'm very happy to uh, give you the outline of it here, but clearly we're quite careful uh, about what we say more generally. But it does, does provide, I think, some context in 2020 and 2021 of the engagement. I wonder whether I could just take this opportunity, Mr Chairman, to point out uh, from the period mid-March to the 30th of August, I had over 40 uh, meetings or telephone calls where Afghanistan was on the agenda. So that's broadly one at least every four days. Um, and uh, that will vary from the NATO foreign ministers meetings, the G7 foreign ministers meeting where I put Afghanistan on the agenda, through to the bilateral contacts with the likes of Turkey, um, through to UN Special Envoy Jean Arnaud. Um, uh, also bear in mind, I appreciate there's a lot of scrutiny about things like calls. Uh, this is taking place uh, along with a range of other simmering issues which may or may not bubble up to crisis. Uh, Iraq, the situation there is very delicate. Iran, JCPOA negotiations, the dual national situation, tax on shipping, Yemen, Tigray, Somalia, Hong Kong, Belarus, Ukraine, coupled with COVID. So I just make the point very gently, if I may, that having a delegation and a division of labour between ministers, particularly my senior ministers of state, actually is a, an essential part of the work we do. Foreign Secretary, I agree with you absolutely. Uh, therefore, may I ask very briefly, uh, <coughs> when was the last time a foreign minister went to Uzbekistan? Went to Uzbekistan? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure I'd have to check, but we've obviously been in yeah, a few countries. When was the last time a foreign minister went to Tajikistan? Again, I don't have the, uh, the visit uh, list, but I'm very happy if you give me your list to provide it. For example, on Uzbekistan, of course, given the need to ensure third part, safe passage to third countries, uh, Lord Ahmed has been in touch with the Uzbek Foreign Minister. I'm scheduled, I was supposed to speak to them today, but it's a national holiday, I'll speak to them uh, tomorrow. So obviously we uh, remain uh, engaged. And if you would like to know the visits, very happy to come back to you. I'd be very grateful. I seems particularly relevant because Heiko Maas was recently in Uzbekistan arranging the evacuation of German people through uh, Tashkent and it seems to be a route that worked extremely effectively for Germany. Although, I, although they have just closed the border. Indeed, they have now, but the Germans got their people out first. May I just ask on the... Um, Would you to speak to a third country what we are doing? I'm just about to come to that Very exact good. question um, because you will also have had... Uh, contact with, of course, our missions in these countries uh, before the 15th of August in order uh, to prepare for a likely fall of Kabul or indeed a collapse of the regime. And I'd be very grateful for when you spoke or whether you can remember speaking to people like Matthew Lawson or Hugh Philpott, for example. Well, all of our ambassadors would feed in their advice through the centre, particularly by the time we were uh, we set up the FCDO emergency response team. So actually, I, I, I wouldn't, I mean, it would depend on the issue. Obviously, I've been in regular contact with Sir Laurie Bristow, um, uh, and, and I've had discussions with uh, various different ambassadors who have joined meetings. 
But actually, the way that it works is that the ambassadors feed through their advice. We obviously see it. It's triaged up. But we get it together. It's uh, triaged up and, and brought together. So I get a full picture. And that's done through, uh, for example, during the time when we had the emergency response team uh, operating the evacuation. Um, and indeed before, uh, my uh, director for Afghanistan, Nigel Casey, and also Tom Drew, my director general. The reason I ask these questions is because uh, in your media round yesterday, uh, you said that it wasn't the responsibility of the Foreign Office uh, for the errors in intelligence that have led us to this position. And I just wondered, I mean, clearly the Prime Minister is responsible for the Joint Intelligence Committee and the assessment it makes. Is that where the responsibility lies with the Prime Minister? Well, actually, you'll recall that after the Chilcot inquiry in the uh, second Iraq war, uh, the JIC was there to give an independent assessment of intelligence precisely to avoid politicise, uh, politicisation. Um, but ultimately, uh, you have the JIC giving its assessment, um, and you then have the military uh, and the diplomatic assessment that's layered on top of that. So it was a collective assessment through the JIC. It was a collective assessment through the JIC that uh, you were referring to. It wasn't a particularly military assessment. Is that correct? Well, uh, the, the JIC is there to provide um, the information, if you like, the raw intelligence is distilled down, and then uh, that is backed up by the military assessment. For example, and things like uh, uh, intent, although, frankly, um, it's a cross-cutting issue. Um, my, my point is this. The central assessment that we were operating to, um, and it was certainly backed up, uh, by both the JIC uh, and the military, is that the likely, most likely, the central proposition was that given the troop withdrawal by the end of uh, August, you would see a, a, a steady deterioration from that point, uh, and that it was unlikely Kabul would fall uh, uh, this year. Uh, that was the central assessment, and of course, with all the usual caveats that you will be familiar with. That doesn't mean we didn't do contingency planning or game out or test the other propositions. And just to be clear, that's something that was widely shared, that view, amongst NATO allies. May I just come straight on to that? Um, you clearly are responsible for overseeing two of our intelligence agencies. Did their intelligence differ, without revealing what it was, of course, did their intelligence differ from that assessment? I, I'm certainly not going to go into the details of raw intelligence. The whole point of the JIC is to distill and provide an objective, rounded assessment. Uh, and I think that's quite right. Okay. And I think, uh, they, think they did their job the, um, uh, uh, very professional. So may I just ask, your principal risk report of the 22nd of July 2021 read uh, on Afghanistan, peace talks are stalled and US-NATO withdrawal is resulting in rapid Taliban advances. This could lead to fall of cities, collapse of security forces, Taliban return to power, mass displacement and significant humanitarian need. The embassy may need to close if security deteriorates. This was on the 22nd of July. How did your actions change after that report? And sorry, the, the source of that? It's your principal risk report. Yeah. Well, as I said, of course we uh, are very mindful of that. So, as I said, um, if you look at um, high-risk embassies, it, from the point of view of the embassy safety, as opposed to the evacuation, I think those two things are important to distinguish. We have a standard uh, evacuation process for high-risk embassies like Kabul. Um, obviously, that's reviewed um, and has to evolve and adapt to the conditions, which is uh, why your um, uh, what you said is uh, timing. Of course, we keep it under review. As I said, the central assessment remained uh, until. Uh, late that the deterioration would be uh, uh, incremental um, and the planning for military withdrawal um, obviously began in April um, but the contingency uh, planning uh, was also there uh, for a more uh, rapid deterioration and you can see that in the run-up to the G7 uh, summit in June one of my focuses was as we anticipated the potential shift from the embassy in the green zone to the airport and the Taipan area was making sure that the so-called enablers, things like evacuation capacity, um, the, the medical uh, capacity, the security at the airport was in place. Um, and we did all of that to make sure that we could shift from the green zone, as we did, to the airport in the 13th or 14th. 
Um, it's also why, just to give you a sense, we speeded up the relocation of former Afghan staff under the Out programme. We did that from April onwards. It's why we changed our travel advice in April. It's why the, the number of UK staff at the Kabul embassy was drawn down from 115 to 75 in May. Um, and uh, uh, so, so whilst the central assessment was the one I described, doesn't mean we weren't doing contingency planning or Scotland all assessments. Can I then ask on the contingency plan very specifically, when did you last update the NEO for Afghanistan? When did we last update the, the non-combatant evacuation operation order for Afghanistan? Um, I, I'd have to check that, but I can tell you that we started planning in June for the contingency of, a, of a, an evacuation um, and therefore a drawdown, full drawdown of the embassy, um, notwithstanding the central assessment still remained. Uh, and of course, the timing on all of this was very much synchronised with what our fellow NATO allies were doing. So as well as the domestic process, we were docking in and checking and sense checking with our NATO allies about um, how they saw things running. And uh, as part of that, presumably, you knew how many British citizens were roughly, or entitled people, were roughly going to be requiring your services? Should well, I'm not sure that is true because of the combination, particularly in Afghanistan, uh, of, un uh, of not just documented passported nationals who may be there travelling, seeing friends, backpacking, whatever it may be, but also, and this was one of the great challenges, um, the, the incidents of large families some of whom were documented mononationals, dual nationals perhaps, but nonetheless documented, others who had a less clear status, either because of their eligibility or because of the lack of documentation. So actually that's one of the reasons why it's been difficult to give a definitive uh, account of the number. I understand that. In that case, may I ask, um, because your assessment of the number of people requiring evacuation went from about 5,000 to about 15,000 who were evacuated, could you tell me why you are confident of your numbers of those remaining in Afghanistan now? We're not confident with any precision at all, um, because for two reasons. No, we don't, we don't think that. We think that uh, in terms of nationals, uh, we're into the hundreds, uh, possibly the, the mid to low hundreds. But again, it depends on eligibility, which of course is one of the things that has been a challenge. What I would say this is we got broadly, um, uh, uh, let me check the numbers so I give you exactly um, the, the right figure. We got, um, uh, something like an estimate of 500 out between uh, April and uh, the 15th uh, of August, um, and in terms of British nationals, uh, a further roughly 7,000 out during the um, period between the 15th and the 29th of August. Alicia, do you want to come? It, it was a quick question about coalition building. Um, so, in terms of a coalition to prevent this outcome, a coalition to see the UK remain with our allies. What went so horribly wrong that only Turkey was willing to stand by the UK? And what could we have done to build a better coalition, to work with partners to build a coalition without the US? So I think this is one of the really important things to nail. Um, and one of the, I, I've said all along, I was uh, very keen that the Foreign Office had a reality check about some of the optimism bias, including the optimism bias, for example, that the Americans would change their mind. If you look at the February 2020 decision, by the previous administration, and then you follow what was happening in the presidential election campaign, and then you follow what the signs were, and indeed then the decision uh, by the incoming Biden administration. I think one of the things I would say is uh, there was some wishful thinking uh, in some quarters internationally uh, that uh, the Biden administration would change or dramatically alter. And I always thought that, and I think this is correct and accurate, and I discussed this with Karen Pierce that the election campaign had baked in a broad, not exact, consensus about some finality to this. Um, uh, forgive me, I, I think with Biden there was no question that he was going to leave. He's wanted to do that for 20 years. Uh, he's always been pushing Obama to leave. That has been Biden's sole purpose of foreign policy to get out of Afghanistan. Why couldn't we convince Germany, France, Norway, any of our other, other uh, allies essentially to form a new coalition on the ground, making up the numbers the Americans were going to take out? I think if you look at the military capacity proportionately that the US put in and therefore the shortfall, I don't think there was any will or appetite. And again, um, don't get me wrong, Lisa, you're right, we checked it, uh, the Defence Secretary's talked about this, it was very clear uh, come the NATO summit 
uh, that I attended uh, uh, in the foreign ministers' meetings that uh, partners would stick to the maxim that NATO went in together, they would adapt the mission together as they did in 2014, and they would exit together. So if I'm honest with you, Alicia, I don't think there was any viable uh, alternative coalition once the US decision had been taken. And again, I think... Uh, there needed to be some reality about that in the public discourse because it was clear to me uh, there were not going to be anyone that could backfill for the capacity that the US provided and the US were unlikely to shift the, the parameters beyond a few months and that is exa exactly what happened. Immediately, with given that's the case and given that you foresaw this, why is it that the French evacuated everybody they had and who was dependent on them and we were scrabbling around uh, with a huge press of crowds at the airport and sadly have left a lot of people behind. Well, I, I'm afraid the, the analogy uh, I don't think runs. I don't, I think you're, I don't think you're comparing uh, like for like. Um, but we, uh, we got out uh, 15, over 15,000 in the last two weeks of August. Um, and, of course, if you look back to April... Uh, when we started to advise, we gave the travel advice that people should leave. We expedited the Arab, uh, um, uh, set up and, and expedited the Arab uh, program. Uh, the reality was many Afghans, uh, so t between that, those two periods, 2,500 I think broadly um, uh, left, including Arab and British nationals. Uh, but the reality was, given the uh, scale of numbers that we have uh, and, the, and the size of our um, uh, the, the nature of our population, not just the size of it. Um, there were lots of people like, uh, who, who were taken su by surprise by the scale and the pace of the Taliban advance. And therefore they only came relatively late on. So we were doing everything we could and we got 2,500 out. But the lion's share, um, as, you, as you know, came with the search for the door once it was evident that Kabul was likely to fall. Bob, you wanted to come on Thank quickly. You, Foreign Secretary, just for clarity's sake, you said in the past a couple of days that everyone was caught by surprise um, and that the intelligence was clearly wrong. Just in, in simple terms, why was that? Is it because we were being led by uh, an over-optimistic assessment from the US? Is that a collective failure on the part of the UK? Was the information different from the military as opposed to the diplomatic channels? Why did we get it so badly wrong? Um, I think there's a whole range of assumptions that, um, uh, one, the optimism bias about what the US might or might not do, um, uh, two, I think around the intent of the Taliban, uh, I always cautioned uh, that I thought the Taliban uh, were uh, unlikely, once the US decision to withdraw was clear, to engage uh, in particular meaningful dialogue around a more inclusive government. Uh, and. Uh, and seize the opportunity to take control. That relates to intent. The much bigger question whether they have the capacity to back up that intent. And I think in fairness, uh, that is something which uh, collectively, cross allies, uh, clearly the assessment that they uh, would not be able to advance to that speed was not correct. Um, and we'll need to look and assess uh, about why that's the case. Can you go any further on that today as to why and where you think? And this is about learning for the future, not just about finding scapegoats, about where that failure came from. You talked about optimism bias. Were there other factors think, you think that are relevant? Well, I want to be respectful. I, I, I've you know, tested, I mean, I've tested uh, the assessments and the evidence. And as I said, partly because of the history of the Foreign Office being accused of being uh, itself optim having an optimism bias, I wanted us to do the opposite. Um, but ultimately, we have got a very rigorous process and uh, we'll have to look at, at, at how the assessments got wrong. I would offer one reflection, and it's no more than that. I think when you've been in a country like Afghanistan for 20 years, and all the blood, sweat and tears and toil, and all the sacrifice, and there'll be people around this committee who will know exactly what that means, I think there is a sense, a desire, an absolute determination to make it uh, work, to make things better, and to, uh, and to believe that you can uh, complete the, the task um, I, I think there's a question at what point, and this goes back to 2001 right the way through, not an attempt to take responsibility of the last period in which this government's been in, but at what point do we really have clearly identified the military objectives, the means to achieve them, and a, a, a clear and coherent exit strategy? I think in fairness, 
That is something that was much debated at the time and in 2014 at the end of combat operations. But I, I think there does need to be uh, a, a consideration of, of how difficult it is when you're in a conflict for 20 years, emotionally if not, not, not anything else, it is to extract yourself. And because of that, despite the fact that you have plans, you were still caught slightly on the hop because of the intelligence failure, despite the best laid plans. Is that fair? Look, the, 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 we always try and, I think as politicians, certainly as ministers, um, and I'm sure across Whitehall, we try and uh, uh, aim out for, the, for these things. But uh, look, you asked me for reflection. Actually, I think uh, uh, we've got a very professional uh, way of approaching these things, but when they're wrong, and we've seen economic forecasts that are wrong, this is obviously a different order of things, but you need to look at how you correct that. Sorry, comment about exit plans. What's, what's the United States exit plan from South Korea? I, I don't know. We are now available in your country. Download the app now. Get all the news on the move.